tonight. I, I'm going to make just a very few comments, and then I'm going to turn it over to the expert. And then I see a lot of experts in the audience here that uh, either speak up or will call on me. But, uh, you, you know, the, the title of, of the conversation tonight is The Future of So. I'm just, I was thinking about that, and, and so it, it, it's hard to think about the future without maybe reflecting on the past. And, and, and you know, Tupelo, I think, early on has valued public education. And, and those of you old enough to think back to the 60s uh, when integration uh, occurred. Most school districts in Mississippi alternatives to public education, uh, and the leaders in Tupelo. Um, I, I, I do want to name one person who I think stepped up statewide, and that was Jack Reed Sr., uh, who I think was head of the Mississippi Economic Council at the at the time. Said we need to stay together because not only is it the right thing to do, it's the best thing to do for our community. And, and I think there's little argument that the success that Tupelo has enjoyed over the years has been greatly influenced by the strength of our public schools. And, and, and so, you know, as we think about where we are and, and where we're going, a, a, a few things came, came to my mind. One is, and I think sometimes we don't appreciate this as much as we should, but just as evidence that Tupelo values public education, organization in the state, AEE, Association of Education Excellence, uh, has been around for more than 25 years. And, and is still providing support for teacher grants in the school district. And you, you, you think about an event coming up this coming Monday, the Teacher of Distinction event that's sponsored by CREATE and AEE and hosted by the Rotary Club and Guanas Club and Civic and Civic Hand Club, by far support event in Mississippi. This coming Monday, 23 teachers will receive a $1,000 check and a real nice award to be spent on whatever they want to spend it on. Not necessarily for school stuff, for, for their personal use. And six assistants will receive $500. That's the largest number of, of um, awards that we've ever given in this program. And, The other thing that comes to mind is uh, Christy Luce corrected me on the date. Uh, I guess time flies. When, but in 2015, Tupelo passed a $44 million bond issue by an 85% vote. And so I, I tell you those things just to say, you know, we can all talk about, oh, public education is important and we value it and we think it's important to the community. Tupelo over and over again has demonstrated by its actions that publication, uh, public education is really important. And so I think uh, most of us believe that. And, and so as we think about the future, one, just one other quick comment that I would make, and this may be fortunate or unfortunate, you can't separate the future of public education in Mississippi from the future of public education in Mississippi. When you look at funding, accountability, regulations, we can go on and on. There are some things that are beyond the control locally. It's controlled by the state. Tupelo has maxed out in local support, local millage for public education. 55 mills at the limit uh, on that. There are a lot of communities around the state that aren't even in the ballpark of, of that. And so I think, again, it's just another example of we do value public education. So 
as we think about the future and and where we go from here and, and how we make public education, et cetera, I couldn't be more excited to have this guy sitting next to me here as superintendent of the Tupelo Public Schools. Uh, we were at a meeting earlier uh, today uh, where uh, Stuart uh, was helping roll out uh, the plan, and I'm sure he'll talk about this, the uh, District of Innovation. And to think in just over a year's time that a tremendous way forward for the community has been put together, and I just made a comment earlier today that it's remarkable to me that that has been done. And so let me be quiet and let uh, Dr. Piku uh, talk about uh, what's going on and, and kind of his vision uh, for the future of, of education. Well, thank you, Mike. It's really good to be here at the Thirsty Devil. Uh, I'm going to channel my inner biker. <laughs> I hope you guys are all doing well. Thank you for being here. A couple of things I want to do before I get to teacher with us on the parkway. What well, grade? Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Ellis is in the back. He's a communications uh, person at the district level. He keeps me pretty scripted, which is a good thing. I need that from time to time. Are there any other current employees in the district that are here? Stuart? Yeah, I was getting ready to get to Stuart. Uh, Stuart did not help me roll that out today. Stuart rolled it out today. Let's give Stuart a big round of applause. <laughs> Stuart's our facilitator of innovative program design, Mrs. McMillan, and uh, she's just done a phenomenal job in uh, designing and helping. I'm a really abstract thinker sometimes, as she will attest to. Stuart's very concrete, sequential. Is that, is that fair, Stuart? We're a good team. We are. The old man and the millennial. That's our name. So. It was really, I would like to encourage you all to show up tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock at the Hancock Center. Uh, we're going to have another meeting tomorrow where we're going to go through the details of the uh, District of Innovation process and some of the programs that we're currently doing and plan to do tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And at 3. And at 3 if you can't make the 8 a.m. meeting. And work on me this week. <laughs> But we're going to have a good meeting. We had a great meeting today. There must have been 25 or 30 41. people. 41. 41 people there today. And all people just as yourselves who are very vested in the future of public education here in Tupelo. Um, a lot to talk about. A lot of exciting ideas. I'll be, I'm open to any questions. Uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, talk a little bit about the District of Innovation process. Not the process. If I had to go into the process, I'd have to ask Stuart for some help on that one. But some of the ideas that we had, the bottom line is, folks, uh, you want to be an innovator. And innovation always runs into regulation, just the way it works. So when you talk about regulation, my mind immediately goes to the accountability model at the state level. We all want transparency. We all want accountability. But we want it in a way that doesn't restrict innovation. So I have no problems with accountability. I have a very serious reservation with letter grades. And I can go into that as much as you want to at length. Uh, it's just not fair to compare schools. Our kids and our schools are more than a letter grading on a billboard on a highway. But when you start to boil down things to a letter grade, you start to disinform the public. You don't inform the public. You disinform the public because it's not accurate. So I'm more than uh, willing to give you some examples. I'll give you one example, the difference between Lawndale and Pierce Street. Lawndale serves our highest risk group of students. Would you agree with that, Dr. Luce? Pierce Street serves West Tupelo. Both groups of teachers are very hard working teachers. Both groups of teachers do a lot of tremendous, incredible work. The one group of teachers get a thousand dollar incentive bonus, the other group, group gets 500. It just doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem fair. And the pressure put on principals and teachers, if you get to that letter grade, is just enormous. It produces a lot of anxiety. So I've been very vocal, outspoken about the letter grade system. It impedes innovation. I have a teacher shaking her head over there. I know she lives under the, it's like having a guillotine over your head at all times. What are we gonna be? What are we gonna be? We gotta get that grade. We gotta get, you know, and it's constant. And you can't blame them because really informing the public. Uh, it doesn't tell the public what percentage of children aren't reading on grade level. 
It doesn't tell the public what percentage of this uh, subgroup, this subgroup. You really want more information than just a letter grade. So my big thing is we're more than a letter grade, so dig deeper when you want information about schools. Because the letter grade only tells a piece of the story. If you had read my op-ed last week, you'd have read, that cat's got a longer tail. And so that, that's pretty much the truth. That cat's got a longer tail. If you want to know about schools, you need to know more than just a letter grade. And so I've been very outspoken about that. Um, I'm from the Houdat Nation, New Orleans. That's where I originally grew up. I was really happy last Sunday. I spent the last 20 years uh, in Alaska working there as a teacher, a principal, and a superintendent. I worked in districts the size of 88,000 square miles with 15 different communities and a district with 25,000 students that was very innovative. Uh, extremely innovative at the Matsuboro School District, which is the home of Sarah Palin, by the way. And no, she really can't see Russia from her house. <laughs> anyway, I'm open to any questions. Our District of Innovation application is focused on career and, co and college readiness. So we, we, we do want to retool our programs to meet the needs of industry so our children graduate with a viable option for participating in a, a 21st century workforce here in Northeast Mississippi and beyond. That's our mission, that's our board goal. It's our fifth board goal. Our board added that goal this year. They have five goals. One goal is to increase academic achievement for all students. The second goal is safe and, and secure school environments. The third goal is um, to make sure we're financially stable, that we keep our finances, that we do good fiscal responsibility. And uh, the fourth goal is, help me, Stuart. Yep, I'm struggling in my presentation. I'll think through it. Fifth is college and career readiness. Fifth is college and career readiness. It was safety, money, academic achievement. Oh, social emotional. No, that would have been in safety. Yep. I just have a, a, a brain lapse. Yep. But the fifth one was our most important one. I'll think of the other career readiness. Everywhere we go, and the research supports the fact that kids are not, students are not graduating from high school prepared to enter into post-secondary education. They're not, and then employers tell us that they're not coming out of high school or college prepared to participate in the workforce. So that's what our big goal is, and that's what our District of Innovation uh, application is going to address. Uh, some of the programs that we have put in place already this year um, safe and civil schools programs at the secondary level are to give our students the ability to and structure our environment for success. The other is uh, we're putting coding in at the K-2 level. A lot of our K-2 schools are starting coding classes. That's really good to start those children really early in coding. Project Lead the Way is a hands-on, higher order thinking, biomedical engineering program that's going in place at the 3-5 level and going to go up to Milam. Um, so middle college, the middle college, we have 11 students participating in the first ever middle college there in a partnership with the Tupelo Public School District and ICC, where students are going to be able to go to the AA degree upon graduation. We're really excited about that one. And then the one we're really excited about is the partnership with the uh, hospital and the Mississippi Rehabilitation Services uh, with some of our children who have special needs that are actually going over to the hospital and working. And at the hospital and, and getting a good work experience at the hospital. We're really excited about that. If you, uh, Stuart says if you ever need a happy pick-me-up or what do you call it, a happy, yeah, happy, a happy place, a happy pick-me-up, go over to the hospital and ask to see those kids working. They're so excited. And it really gets down to what our fundamental is in every child. Uh, so we're just looking at every way that we can do so so that every child walks across that stage with a purpose, a reason, an idea of what a vision of themselves in the future. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Do you have some questions, Mike? Anybody else? Questions. Hey, I've seen you mention anything about the arts. Oh yeah, yeah, there you go. I remember you. <laughs> well, we just recently added a staff member, Mrs. Kit Stafford. She's an arts integration expert. We're very committed to the arts. The school board set aside in a committed fund, $300,000 for the arts. So we're funding the arts programs like we haven't in the past. That's a lot of money to put aside for musical instruments, 
uh, upgrades to their their stages and things like that. As we go around and we look for um, things that we need, that's what we've done the first year. Uh, Stuart and I and, and, and Greg and others, we went around to every school and we pretty much just listened. What do you need? What are your thoughts? Where do we need to go with this? We rose very high in terms of our list of needs. So we're definitely committed to the arts and reinvigorating the arts integration program. And I think you're going to see a lot of great work now that we have someone focused on yeah. that. Yeah. I'm excited about that. But my kindergartner has art once every eight days. Yeah. So yeah, that's a big problem. Exactly right. And previously, before we hired this position, I don't know how many people know Mrs. Stafford, but she's a well-known person in the community when it comes to the arts. I think she's going to be in the... As you know, as an art teacher, uh, it's not easy to organize the materials and get the kids in little groups and, and focus them on what they have to do. And if you only see your child and your student once every eight days, they start a project, and it's eight more days before they get to go back to that project. They lose interest in that project. Yeah, so definitely art is very important, but art has been a casualty of the accountability model. I mean, I think you would agree with that. It's been a casualty uh, because teachers don't have the time when they're focused on what happens to art, what happens to music, what happens to those things that are important to the community. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Grace? This is a question that maybe has to do with the future more so than the present. If we cannot come up with some agreement around I think it's really important to, to always deal with public school funding. You know, my goal here in Alaska uh, has been that both sides want good quality schools. Republicans and Democrats want good quality schools. I typically don't go, didn't go to Juneau and I don't go to Jackson and necessarily always asking for more money. I ask to be freed up to spend the money I have better. And free me from some of these unnecessary expensive regulations and different things that I'm being forced to do so that we can spend the money according to the needs of the community if we really believe in local control. Did that answer your question? It did from, from the perspective of being innovative and funding and using the funding that you get. Yeah. I was reflecting on what we had in our previous meeting when Nancy Bloom was here with some others about her comments around the fact that we continue to lose, for instance, 600 special ed teachers who were not able to be yeah. hired because you had to eat up some of your money to meet the requirements of the law. Yeah. And so if that continues for three more years or two more years, will that eventually start to cut into and we're very fortunate here as we that are close by and don't enjoy this type of support. Overall, I guess the concern I have is how it will eventually fall. Oh, it definitely will really erode the quality of education across the state, yeah. Because, like you said, there are districts that aren't as fortunate as we are. Yeah. Yes, sir? You mentioned college ready, et cetera. Uh, I'm a little... Career in college. I'm a little concerned that I don't hear that we're going to have any kind of serious focus on job training for the trades. Not everybody is going to college. Not everybody wants to go to college. Not everybody wants to have a six-figure debt. But truck drivers, masons, uh, plumbers, etc., they all make sixty to 100000 a year, and that's a legitimate earning. 
Yeah, no, just because you didn't hear me say it in the first five minutes. You're absolutely correct. I mean, um, I reflect on my own experience. I was just like a lot of these kids in high school when I was in high school, messing around. And the principal called my dad to the office and said, you're wa he's wasting our time. My dad's response was, you're both wasting mine. You won't be here tomorrow. <laughs> and the next day, a truckload of Louisiana rednecks pulled up in front of the house and were told to shoot me with a nail gun if I slowed down. <laughs> well, consequently, I learned how to frame houses and was able to pay my tuition at Tulane University in cash in a brown paper bag. And so I, I, I am very focused on the truth. We're going to expand upon that program. Our goal is to connect it to the industry. Workers in this community could all get involved in that, where these entry-level employees are well-trained through our program and a partnership with ICC. So that, we're definitely focused on that. That's one of our big needs that were identified, one of our top needs that were identified by the community. So we're focused on that. I believe we are. Yes, ma'am. We are still using the Barton. We just hired a dyslexic coordinator uh, here in the district to help with that. We, we're finding more and more children who do have dyslexia. It's just a child who reads slower than other children, has difficulties with letters, and, and focusing on his or her. That's actually not the definition. Well, that's probably a better definition. You want to share it? I can read it. I'll walk through it. Oh, good. Yeah, that will help us. Yeah. And, and I also brought you an email from Mississippi Department of Education that I received today that said that dyslexia was not a special education disability, which is not true. Yeah. And I have that in writing, and I, I want to let you know that parents across this state are told that on a daily basis. Oh, yeah. Both in this district, not as much in this district since I've been well. sometimes with other things, but he can take a test. My youngest son does have dyslexia, and he was diagnosed through the uh, regional rehab center. So well, I'm learning about it as a parent. College, but yeah. They were great as well. yeah. But are we telling them? Hiring someone to do it. Not that part of the program we're not telling them, because I'll tell you, they were not happy that I knew about that. 
Jackson. Yeah, no, I don't know what the state's telling people. I'm not in no, Jackson. That, that was not true. You weren't here yet. Yeah, okay. well, we, that's why we hired an expert. I report all my ideas. Maybe I got that on I'm sure you do, and I would too. But that's why we hired an expert. We didn't have an expert, so now we do. That, those yeah. Yeah, she's been contacting parents and setting up meetings, and I know I have my meeting coming up. So, yeah, so we're gonna do what we can to, to address the needs of our dyslexic children. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've seen just since the changes in my youngest son really grow in the, in the last two or three weeks. Oh, my daughter. Yeah. Look, we had the exemption for the third grade game, uh, and so did my autistic daughter, but you have to take it once. I'm happy to say that all three of my children passed that gate, but the same two that were there under the protection test 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 gets displaced children, mm -hmm. and they are stressed. So my straight A beta club fourth grader was also a nervous wreck going into that test. So yeah. it's, it's, they get stressed too, the children. Yeah. Yeah. Your son. yeah. My youngest son, the first time he took the uh, state test, uh, well, even not the state test, but our internal assessment that prepares them for the state test. Uh, he came home and he was laying in his bed, his little head in the pillow crying, uh, Dad, you know, there's something wrong with my brain. There's something wrong with my brain. And my response to him was, son, there's nothing wrong with your brain. There's something wrong with that test. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And you just work hard and we're going to help you and do what you got to do. And he's done really well. And it's all about focusing on their strengths and not their weaknesses and not letting the system hurt their confidence and demoralize them. That's kind of what we're looking at. I just say, <clears throat> if there's not a quick fix and solve all the issues, but as I said earlier, it gives me great confidence to have somebody talk the way that he just talked and personal experience, because he knows it's an issue. And, and there are plenty of smart people out there <laughs> with dyslexia that we just have to accommodate and figure out a way to connect the dots. And, other other questions, comments from anyone? I, I would just like to ask you to say your districts of innovation thing. That one of the principal things that you're doing is making school relevant for students, and I and I think that's been one of the issues that we've had is with all the testing, testing, testing. It's like, what does this have to do? with what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And so it seems like that's a real priority for the district. Yeah, I'd have to say, you know, just taking the, uh, uh, the guillotine off the heads of teachers has been a big difference. Freeing them up to do what they know how to do in the classroom <laughs> and uh, giving them the ability to make educational decisions and the principals the ability to make educational decisions. You know, we didn't want to, um, dismantle the whole system because the reality is we have the accountability model and we have to respond to it but we wanted to overlay and inject opportunities for folks to be creative and to bring exciting learning opportunities and, and one of those things is project lead the way um, we're really excited about that that's a partnership uh, that we're doing you want to talk a little bit about that yeah. the funding yeah. through toyota wells dr lewis want to do that one more time shout out yeah and it, it's it, can I can I call a lifeline real quick on Project Lead the Way? <laughs> Stuart, would you talk a little bit about Project Lead the Way for folks? Yeah. Yeah. So Project Lead the Way. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I don't. I'm not. Really There's a stool up there. Who wanted to speak about what you're talking about? Uh, so Project Lead the Way at its core is focused on three key areas. It is computer science, biomedical science, and engineering. And when you look at it at the elementary level, pre-K through fifth grade based experiences and opportunities for students to deeply engage with material. Um, I'll give you an example of one of the modules we're implementing in fifth grade in a specials class with all students. Every fifth grader in Tupelo Public School District will have infection detection. And it is, like it sounds, it is learning about pathogens, it is learning about processes, it is doing activities and experiences, it is problem solving how to handle real world experiences and coming up with authentic innovative ways to do that. Um, and we're really excited about that. That will be happening in the spring, and we plan to do some parent engagement sessions at every 3-5 school. We, the school district, have devoted funds related to that to make sure all students have that experience. 
Um, so when you transition up, as Dr. Fiku shared, one of our District of Innovation components in our waiver, we would like to implement that at the sixth grade level. And when you start looking sixth, seventh, and eighth, those become Project Lead the Way as actual courses, nine weeks or semester long that we will pair together to create a year-long class. And at the middle school level right now, the state doesn't has not approved Project Lead the Way to count towards a level of rigor, the level of relevancy, that that is best for kids and that we should be doing that at that level. So we're going to be working on that and pushing up. And then what we haven't looked at yet, but could be a frontier down the line, is the high school level. And that really gets into year-long courses, engineering one, engineering design, biomedical courses, computer science, and looking at that at the high school level. And at that level, the state already has approved almost every high school course for Carnegie Unit Credit, either as an elective or an advanced science option. Um, so we're excited. The state has been responsive to Project Lead the Way, has been looking at it, and has already shown that they at that level do see significant value in this related to the relevancy, related to that work. Um, I'll just say as well, in, in making those decisions about what courses we're implementing, we want to be responsive to the community. And we are very grateful that we have such a strong healthcare system. We are in partnership with the hospital in so many ways and feel like that biomedical route is really important. Similar with engineering and connecting with high in demand um, jobs and then also computer science with information technology. So I think we'll continue to have conversations about what our community needs and how we align Project Lead the Way to best meet those needs. We're really excited about this 3-5 implementation this year, the potential of sixth grade next year, looking at expanding that in future years, and the potential of going up. We're also looking down. How do we look at this starts in pre-K, and we could be looking in future years at pushing down. I think right now we're not doing that because we've had a strong focus our other foundational skills and there have been enough changes that we don't want to overwhelm our teachers and students in the system. Um, at our community meeting today I had a, a parent that wrote a question that didn't ask about our focus on literacy K-3 and we have made a vested interest in core reading training for all K-2 teachers in the fundamentals of how you actually teach phonics and, and, and letter development etc. Um, so really looking forward to, to that work. So I appreciate that. Do what I like to do is you don't have to know everything, you just got to hire the people who do. <laughs> but I, I asked Sean the bar today, I said, how did your daughter get so smart? And she said, I married well. So, I'll tell my mom that. Yeah, like yeah. It. Hey, um, one support mechanism for the things that y'all have been describing, and you mentioned it, is the Toyota Wellspring Fund. Yeah. By the way, this is the 10th anniversary of the Toyota Wellspring Fund. Uh, they set it up at the Create Foundation. There's over 50, which generates $2 million a year, every year. And if we could, I'd like to ask Christy Luce if she would just quickly share two really important things that are going on right now. One that's really, I think, important and it's a partnership with the, with the eight school districts in the three counties uh, is with career coaches. So Christy, talk about that, please. I like the way our boss is kind of impromptu <laughs> us. <laughs> They'll get it back. First of all, I'm Christy Lewis and I work at the Create Foundation. And um, the Toyota Wellspring tenants are Expose, Prepare, and Connect. And, you know, our eighth grade students have the Career Expo where they're exposed to all types of career opportunities and 18 career pathways. The second thing is to prepare them, to expose, prepare, and connect the students. Preparing them when they're at the high school level to make sure they understand really what's out there in our high demand work sector, our high demand strategies, and making sure we're tailoring those jobs and experiences for those students in our schools, again, making school relevant. Those students from K all the way, or even pre K, all the way to 12th grade into the real world, making school relevant again outside the classroom, the four walls. And so, what we've done is we have added in Pontotoc and Union and Lake Counties in eight school districts at 14 high schools, we added 11 career coaches. 
Y'all, that's amazing because our high school counselors are overwhelmed, our teachers are overwhelmed sometimes, and so the ability to have someone that really advocates for what real career awareness is, linking education to careers, has been absolutely essential. And starting on Monday, speaking of not only is it just Pontotoc Union and Lee Counties, but we've had another fund that has given a grant to Houston High School. Houston High School just hired a retired Exxon Mobil chemical engineer as their career coach. So it's really becoming a kind of a thing, meaning translating what the real world is, but back into the classrooms, backing those things up, aligning our pathways and programs, and making sure again school is relevant. And y'all, it's got to be fun. Let's admit it. We remember the best teachers because they were fun. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and that's the arts. So that's kind of what it does. If you need anything, I'm Christy and Create and Exposed Prepare and Connect Our Kids. Oh, so you've got one more. Okay. So when we talk about exposing, we talked about the Career Expo. The Wellspring has three really big projects. We've got STEAM grants with half a million dollars to all of our Pontotoc Union and Lee County School Districts. We've got the Career Coaches I just mentioned and the Career Expo. Because this is 10 years, 7,200 eighth graders come in three days. I'm on the bus lot every 15 on Wednesday at 2 o'clock we have public hours and we invite you to our 10 year celebration. We're going to have all kinds of folks from the community. The great thing is if you're not an 8th grader, which I'm not sure we see any 8th graders in the room, it's a great chance for you to come see what's taking place and be able to have that language and knowledge and share with not only your students, your children, your grandchildren, but also your neighbors and community and people that you see out in the restaurants and at your churches. So October the 2nd. 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock is the public hours, and then we have a celebration, I think, at 3 o'clock, or that's what's taking place this year. And y'all, that's two or three weeks away. Where? At the Bank for South Arena. Great question. And, and don't forget, if you want to be part of it, you can volunteer. Let's yes, we also need volunteers. If you're interested, go to the Create Foundation website, and we're taking that. Alvin Bennett, one of my counterparts, handles all of that. She's the one that's the coordinator, and I just direct the buses. So please volunteer, please come, and please join us for the public hours and celebration. It really is, it's a great thing because I feel like when I see those opportunities, I can't imagine what I would that Northeast Mississippi has. Change the landscape of education, it's going to start here. It's going to start here in Northeast Mississippi. So change what it looks like in the classroom. Is that it? Okay, I'm pretty good. And, and just the, those of you that haven't been there, this is not a deal where kids walk around picking up brochures. I mean, it is a very interactive thing where an eighth grader can sit down and manipulate a Da Vinci surgical robot. North Mississippi Medical Center two or three years ago to look at the newest version of a surgical uh, device and. Uh, and Toyota's exhibit, as you might imagine, is unbelievable to show how a car is made and all the jobs and Caterpillar. And we had 114 people from Columbus Air Force Base in eight different pathways for three days. So I would encourage you to come. I promise you <clears> that this is not like anything you've seen, I think, before. But again, the connection is it it happens in our schools and that connection with relevant relevance and, and helping our students understand there, there's something out there that you could do that you would enjoy doing that you'd make money doing but you got to get an education first at our certifications at some level so it, it's a big deal and it's uh, it, it, i think it's really important and we're fortunate to, to have this opportunity for our, our actual 17 county. Comments? What are we missing tonight? I have a question. Well, I kind of have a two-part question. You were, you were talking about um, the letter grades earlier, and I feel like the letter grades create uh, a system of winners and losers, and we can't have schools with kids in them that are losers. We need all of our schools
Yeah, let me address that one first. We still, we won't get a waiver from that. That's a law, and that's, um, it doesn't mean you can't change a law. Like I said earlier, it's more a political conversation than it is an educational conversation. And the reality is that um, the, the model, the way it's currently constructed, was designed for a specific reason. Not necessarily the original intent was to compare and create winners and losers. They just saw it at the time. Uh, they saw it as a way to communicate to parents about the quality of schools. If you look at uh, MDE's website, they very clearly tell you what it is and what it isn't. And it shouldn't be used to compare teachers or to compare schools because there are various variables within every school and in every community that, in, that influences the outcome. And you, so you can't compare, for instance, Tupelo to Boonville. It's just not a fair comparison. We have 470 EL students. They have zero. And EL students count six times in the model. They don't know those are our children who are new to the country. They know very uh, little English, and they're learning English. So those children count greatly in the model. Now, we want them to grow just like all children, but should they count that many times against us and influence our letter grade that heavily? So that's why you can't compare communities. You can't compare districts where there's a lot of money to districts in the Delta where there's no money. You know, that's an unfair comparison. So it just doesn't tell the whole story, but I don't think, it's really up to us how we decide to interpret the model. Tupelo needs to ask themselves what kind of district do they want to be. Uh, and given our demographics, given our free and reduced lunch, given our special education population, given our DL population, chasing that model is really hard to do. Uh, and that's the same for every district that has the same numbers that we have in those various subgroups. Uh, it's up to us how we interpret those letter grades. I say we celebrate success, celebrate small, celebrate often. We all want to be an A. We're going to celebrate our A's. We're going to celebrate our B's. There's good work in an A. And on every any given day, there's a miracle happening, even in the schools that are receiving an F. Uh, that's my opinion, my personal and professional opinion. Because I have worked in schools that would have received an F, but unbelievable work happened in that school, given the poverty level in that school. And I've worked in schools that would have been an A, and great work happening there, and needs for improvement in that A school as well. So it's all up to us how we interpret those letter grades. But I don't think, I really don't believe in my heart of hearts that the people at the state level or in the legislative branch designed the model to create. That's how people interpret Yeah. Like if you're an L Yeah, and there's work that has to be done in every school. Really label people. Yeah. Yes, sir. On, on that same topic, is there any discussion about setting those cut scores for those accountability scores before the school year is over? I mean, I, I know as a principal, we we did all the work, but we didn't know what we were going to be. Yeah. Right. I mean, until they determine. So many are going to be A's, so many are going to be B's. And it changes every year. And it changes every yeah. year. Yeah. So it was a moving target. Is there any discussion about I'm loose and I shot my four-wheeler and I had to walk about uh, eight miles back to my house. It's the same kind of deal. At least two or three years as, as a high school principal, we would have been an A school, but they moved the line. And we missed it by one or two points. And we were so what's the point? Right. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's up to us. It, my thing is, it's one week of testing in an entire school year. We need to celebrate and tell our story and tell the success of our story and not let that letter grade really define us. I, I, I agree with that. It, yeah. it's, it's just that what people see is that score. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> I agree. And it'd be nice if we knew what it was going to be. Right. <laughs> we knew what we were shooting at. Yeah. Because it's a long walk home. So <laughs> I'm assuming there's, there's no discussion on that. Not, it would, if it's happening, it's not at my level. Okay. 
I don't know that uh, it's happening at any level other than at the state level. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I cannot leave this room or this conversation if you do not speak about the early. Oh, I knew that. I was I was saving the best for last. Okay. Well, <laughs> We have one of the most phenomenal early childhood schools, would you agree? Yes. Yeah, we do. We really do. Our early childhood school is just a happy, happy place to be. Young children are learning over there. Everybody I talk to, every time Buzzy Mize comes by my office, he talks about how happy he is when he goes over there. He's a grandpa, he has a grandchild in that school, and he comes to my office. Oh, I just love that early childhood school. That, that Miss Stewart, she's the greatest. And it really is, it's a phenomenal thing. The community support to be able to fund that school. You know, when you talked about the 55 mills, that's the kind of money that helps us fund the, that type of experience, because that's not the norm, as you know, around the state. And then we're having conversations about uh, partnering with our local daycares and Head Start, what we can do in order to increase that partnership and, and, and so that all children come to school uh, prepared to learn. You might also want to mention back to Wellspring and the funding for the TPSD Discovery, yeah. Dr. Pikachu. Yeah, the, the summer program. That number has grown where children are coming in before school starts and never had school experience. Yeah, and they go to school. That was at the Early Childhood Center yeah, where the parents helped participate too. And we went to that celebration and all those parents were really excited, very excited to have that opportunity. Yeah. Anything else? We'll, we'll wrap up here. You know, the real hero in this room is this young lady sitting right here that's a first grade teacher. I thought, Doris, I thought, I said this last week, Christy, I thought that I knew just a tiny, tiny bit about education. I was on the Tupelo School Board for, for 10 years. Well, when my daughter graduated from Mississippi State and came home and was an elementary school teacher uh, in Tupelo, I got a real education <clears throat> about what teachers do. And so we can talk about the testing and all of that, but I'm telling you what, day in and day out, what we ask our teachers to do is unbelievable. And it may kind of be a job but I believe it's a calling for anybody that invests their life in being a teacher. And I, let's give you a hand. Well, listen, <clears throat> there's a lot of room for improvement. Kathy Gray. Right. Including around us. And so that makes what you just said about her and everybody else that works every day even more precious because they are not getting compensated at the level that even the Southeastern average teachers are. They're not doing it for the money, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's one of the issues, and we haven't even talked about that tonight, but for the future, uh, the availability of qualified teachers, that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, we're, our schools are not graduating enough teachers to fill the positions that we have, and especially districts where people don't want to teach. The environment's not good, it's even harder. So lots of, yeah. Yeah, you'd be surprised how many of our teachers have second and third jobs, where they're working weekends. Uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty common, you know, working at, after school, second and third jobs, just trying to make it work. And, uh, but we're just blessed here to have such, people ask me all the time, what's one of the biggest surprises that I've had since coming to Tupelo? And I'd have to say it's the commitment of our staff, our teachers, our support staff, and our principals. They're just phenomenal people who are committed to the mission. And it's, a, it's an act of love. So I just really appreciate all that they do every single day as, they, as these children walk through the doors. Because some of these children are carrying bags of rocks with them. They really are, they come from experiences 
emotional rocks, if you know what I'm saying, where they come from experiences that are very difficult. And you know the children that come through your door every day, you never know what they went through to get to school. So we really appreciate what our teachers do every day. We want to thank the Mississippi Humanities Council. Caroline, thank you for organizing this. We want also again want to thank the Phil Harden Foundation for their funding uh, uh, for the good food and 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 providing the space uh, uh, tonight. And Carolyn, anything that you want to add before we close it up? Thank you for being here, Mike. <laughs> oh, the track in the team stakeholders is that other board door. <laughs> <laughs> Good job.